Hello everyone and welcome back to my top 100 list. This is it, this is, we're starting off, this is the top 50 now, so let's get straight into it. Number 50 is Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon. Now the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series is absolutely amazing, one of my favorites, and the problem with doing this list, um, <laughs> back... Uh, from the bottom up to the top, is that I always have to start by talking with the worst of the series, uh, and that's no exception here, where I'm talking about Super Mystery Dungeon before the one or two that I may have put on here higher up. <laughs> so, I'm going to be talking about a lot of the things I don't like about the game, and then in later ones we'll just talk about the things I did like about the series. So, Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon is a continuation of the Mystery Dungeon series with amazing graphics, like they really bumped up the graphics like an insane amount, like it's all proper 3D and everything, the, the crazy things they can do on the 3DS now is, uh, is really insane, because when I think handheld I always thought like really crushed pixely sprites, but you know, um... Technology has evolved, and now the 3DS can actually give us some really proper stuff. So, there you go. Super Mystery Dungeon looks great. Um, it plays uh, the same as the other Mystery Dungeon, except for blue, but we'll, uh, blue and red, but we'll get onto that. Uh, it's a really streamlined, really nice Mystery Dungeon game. The problems I have with it is that the game really hammers home that you are a, a kid. Uh, to the point where it just sort of gets distracting, and would pull you out of the game if you were anything older than, like, 14. I think by the time you hit 14 years old, um, you start feeling pandered to in the game. Uh, and I was 22 when I played it, so imagine how I felt. Um, the whole game starts off with you being a kid, um, having to go to school, um, being called a kid by, like, every single character, and because it's you, you are playing as this person. Like, it's not like... It's not like in the main series where you're taking control of someone and, you know, they don't really mention your age, or if you're playing a game where you are playing the character um, that just so happens to be that age. I can't think of a game that has a child as the main protagonist, but say there was... What was that game that came out? Lucifer? That's a terrible example. <laughs> um, but say there was a game where you, uh, you're the protagonist and the protagonist just so happens to be 12 years old, but he's not you. He is the character you're controlling, right? That's different than having... What's your name? Okay, this is you as a Pokemon, and you, the player, are a kid. That's different, and I really don't like that they did that. Um, and the big irony here is that Super Mystery Dungeon is actually the hardest Pokemon Mystery Dungeon game I've ever played. Seriously. It's not... It's pretty rare that I get stuck on the Mystery Dungeon game uh, on the third dungeon. In fact, that's never happened. Usually when I get stuck, it's halfway through the game on some really bad boss, like, for... Let's not spoil what game it is, but let's say the Luxio fight, or endgame stuff like the Dialga fight, um, stuff like that. You don't really get... Because I still felt like I was in a tutorial. The pace is really weird. But, of course, it still plays really well. Um, I don't know all the mechanics, which is why it's so low on the list, because I haven't actually really finished it. I got stuck. So I can't give it a fair review, and I can't say that it's higher up. So, there you go. God, I've talked so long about this game. Right, next. Number 49. Bomberman 64. Oh, just... Okay, the battle mode in Bomberman 64 is one of the best Bomberman battle modes you will ever have. The music is amazing and iconic. The the 3D graphics, uh, and having the sort of 3D instead of the just the sort of 2D grid that you even have now... Um, in like Bomberman Wii and Bomberman Switch and Bomberman Xbox One, they still have that overview grid, right? Well, this one, you could roam around freely in a 3D space, and the controls were very good. They were like uh, Mario 64, like proper controls. And when you can do that, the game starts to get really frantic and interesting. It's a, it's a new sort of take on it that they seriously have rarely, if ever, redone. Honestly, Bomberman 64, just for the battle mode. Oh, and one of my favorite things about the battle mode, even more so, is that when you get the sun death, you hear, hurry up, and then the music like speeds up and becomes more epic, and then depending on what, um, depending on what stage you chose, and yes, there are different stages, and it's not just like in the other ones where it's just like pretty much just a color swap. This one actually has some, uh, 
different designs. Either the walls will close in, or like things will like just fall from the sky, like meteors will fall from the sky, or my favorite one, um, the water will slowly rise, which is really cool on the, um, the stage where you have a bottom plane and then stairs and then a higher plane, and yes, that's another thing that this game did. Seriously, the battle mode of Bomberman 64 I think is still the best out of any Bomberman, honestly. I will go down in history and say Bomberman 64, they never did a battle mode better. But, yeah. Uh, when the water's rising and you're all on that, like, you're all on the top one and at any moment someone could kick a bomb at you and it would knock you back and if it knocked you back when you're standing in the wrong position you would go down into the bottom layer but the bottom layer is completely filled with water so you instantly drown and the fact that you could, like, blow up the bombs and make massive bombs, you didn't need a power-up for that but you could get power-ups and the skulls were really cool because they did all these funky things. Oh my god, Bomberman 64's battle mode! It's just insane. And that's just the side part. Bomberman 64 actually has a story mode where you go through all these different worlds, um, attacking enemies with your bombs, getting gold cards, and getting to the end and fighting all the bosses. Now that's one that was really difficult for me, and I never actually played it that much. Bomberman 64 really is on here just for the battle mode. And you know what? It fully deserves that, because not only is it the best battle mode in all Bomberman, but it comes with you know an actual main story that... I guess you're supposed to do, but I never did. But it gets bonus points for having it. One of these days I'll have to do that. But I keep getting stuck, so maybe I'll do it through a walkthrough and then try it on my own the second run. Just to get through it. But, yeah, Bomberman 64? Seriously, grab some friends, play the battle mode, you'll have fun. Number 48. Super Mario RPG. Now, this is an interesting one, because... This game never came out in the uh, Europe slash PAL region. This game for the longest time was America and Japan only. So, people talking about their great memories with Super Mario RPG, I never had any great memories with RPG. If I saw this game at Video Easy, that's Australian blockbusters, um, I definitely would have picked it up and I probably would have really enjoyed it. But, what can I say? We never got it. I think the first time we got it was on the Virtual Console for like the Wii U or something, but really the first time we actually got to properly play the game with the right controllers and everything was with the SNES Mini that came out last year. So this game has been something that took a long time for me to play properly as someone from the Europe region. But holy crap, even though the first time I played it was in 2017, it held up. With absolutely no nostalgia goggles, I can say that Super Mario RPG, even though it's like over 20 years old, holds up insanely well. It is really fun, if not a bit linear for an RPG, but it's just so much fun. This is the first game that sort of gave Mario characters some, well, character, especially Bowser. I love the characterization they gave Bowser. This is probably the first time that Bowser actually had a motive other than, ah, oh, kidnap Peach. Oh, I'm dead. Like this was when he actually started getting some like proper things going. And then you had Gino, which was a great character that unfortunately Square Enix will never let us see again. But I can't get too mad at him because one of their games is higher up on the list. So shh. <laughs> but yeah, this was just an amazing game. Probably one of my favorite RPGs, and I'm a big RPG fan. So, Super Mario RPG, just an amazing all-round game that still holds up today, and I definitely recommend it. Uh, if you're in Europe, I may just recommend a SNES Mini just for this, because you can't really get it any other way. Well, I mean, I guess you could emulate it, but that's not official. I guess you get it on the Virtual Console, but then you have to use the fucking um, game pads, and none of them feel right for this game, so don't even bother. Anyway, enough rambling. It's time for number 47, which is Pokemon Stadium 1. Now, this is the one that I'm a lot more nostalgic for, and in fact, I realized when talking about Pokemon Stadium 2, I started getting in this weird ramble because it was so late at night where I just... My brain switched into Pokemon Stadium 1, and I started talking about that for like a minute or two without realizing it. So, Pokemon Stadium. What a great game. The first time we got to see our Pokemon in the 3D space, and man, did they look so awesome at the time, and they still kind of hold up today. Uh, the fact that you could do, like, two-on-two -two Pokemon battles and, like, battle with all your friends just sitting there at one console instead of having to link up, like, ten 
Game Boys, and you could have like three or four people play it all at once, was amazing fun. And what was even more amazing fun was the mini games. Now I talked about Pokemon Stadium's two mini games, and they're really fun. Pokemon Stadium One didn't slap. They also have really fun mini games: Magic Cup Splash, Run Run Run, Run, the Clefairy Memory Game, the Sand Slash Dig, Metapods Harden. These are all just off the top of my head. I don't have any like I don't have anything listing off the mini games. This is just how ingrained they are in my head that I can just list them all off to you. Licky Tongue Sushi, there's another one. It's just, this was a really great game, and even though I didn't do too much of the gym battles, even though that is an amazing section now that as an adult, as a kid it was always about being able to play Pokemon with my friends and being able to play the mini games. And I still really respect it for that, and all the time I had playing with it. And it was kind of a launching point, because I never really had handheld consoles. I always played home consoles, so... With Pokemon, there was sort of a, I kind of played it, but not really. So when I had Pokemon Stadium, so I could sit down and properly play a Pokemon game, it sort of got me into it. Then I got um, Ruby and Sapphire, the next one's up. And then ever since then, I've been getting uh, every Pokemon game since. Diamond, Black, X, so on and so on. That was the start, that was the launching point, so I have to give it a lot of respect points for that. Number 46, now this is a really new one. This one is the one that went on the list this year because I remember playing it when it was ported to the Switch and that is L.A. Noir. And man, am I kicking myself for waiting so long to play this game. I always had a bit of interest in it. The fact that you could do like detective stuff, which I was a big fan of. It's all set in the 50s, which I'm a big fan of. Um, wow, this game is so, so good. It's story is amazing. I'm one that really likes story games. Obviously. How many Telltale things have I put here? Every Walking Dead they've ever done. Except Season 4, but who knows if we're finishing that. Uh, that's a bit rocky ground at the time of recording this, but anyway, uh, enough of that weirdness. Yes, this is such a good story mode. Um, there's not many games where I get so sucked into the story that I play the whole 24-hour session in like a, a three-day sitting because, you know, I either work or I spend time with friends. I don't have time to sit there um, eight hours in one session. But with L.A. Noir, it sucked me in for that. So, yeah. And when I got to the end of it, I just sort of sat there like, wow, <laughs> that, was, that was an experience. Um, the gameplay itself, you could say, is kind of bare bones, but compared to The Walking Dead, it's a crazy. Um, you can drive around, it is made by Rockstar. Sorry, um, yeah, it is made by Rockstar, so, you know, uh, the cars aren't as great as they are in GTA, obviously because you're controlling 1940s, 1950s cars, so they're obviously not going to control as great. But, driving around the city was great fun, and there's, you can always just, um, have your partner drive, and just fast travel there, but I never used it. I always drove around on my own because it was so nice. You could hear the conversations that you and your partner would have, driving around, seeing all the sights. You didn't want to skip it. Um, they made it interesting enough where I sat there and I wanted to take the long route and get all the story that I could out of the game, and it really rewarded me. And I'll admit, at some points, I may have had to look up uh, answers online because I didn't want to get it wrong and get... Um, sort of a bad ending or whatever, but it turns out that no matter what you do, the ending isn't exactly sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, so whatever. <laughs> but yeah, L.A. Noire is an amazing, amazing experience, and like I said, such a shame that I waited like half a decade to finally get my hands on it, because, oh boy, it is an amazing story game. Number 45, we have WarriorWare Gold, the WarriorWare series. Now, this is a series that how do you explain WarriorWare? Did I already explain WarriorWare? Was there a WarriorWare lower down on the list? I'm going to check that now before I start explaining WarriorWare again. I don't think I did. No, I didn't. So, WarriorWare. <laughs> WarriorWare is a game where... Actually, I really feel like I've said this. I'm so sorry. There is another WarriorWare. Yes, okay, I did I did explain WarriorWare with Smooth Moves. So, WarriorWare Gold is even better than Smooth Moves. WarriorWare Gold took sort of everything from all the past WarriorWare games and put it into one sort of massive bundle. Uh, had all the great characters, all the great micro-games, 
a bunch of uh, extras and unlockables that you could do. And even though there was a limited amount of games and a limited amount of things you could do, its replayability was through the roof. And, can I just say, this game gets like 100 points because Charles Martinet does a full Wario voiceover. A full, like, complete dialogue as Wario. If that doesn't get it in top 100, the fucking nothing will. That, when I first heard that, that, when I first heard it, I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Charles Martinet uh, doing, like, the whole thing. It was really, really cool. And, of course, I'm not putting it here just because we get to hear Charles Martinet as Wario. Of course, all the micro games were solid. The controls were um, really tight and really nice. Uh, the whole game was just an amazing experience and one that I'm really glad came out. It didn't come out to much fanfare, and I don't think it sold too much, which is a shame, because I think a lot of people should be picking up this game if you have a uh, 3DS. And I don't know why on my top 100 list I've put it down as a Switch game. That was silly of me. But yeah, if you have a 3DS, definitely go and pick this game up. You will definitely enjoy it. Well, fingers crossed you will. <laughs> Number 44, Mario Kart Wii. Now, Mario Kart... I've said a lot about Mario Kart already in this list, so let me just say why I liked Wii the most. Um, it had so many new courses. I don't think I've ever been so... Um, taken aback by all the new courses as I was in Mario Kart Wii. I think the Mario Kart Wii was the last time where I was able to look at all these new courses and sort of be overwhelmed by like, oh my god, before we had sort of the Mario Kart 7 and 8 thing where, you know, you're, we're at an age now where you expect so many new tracks, but back in 2007 or whatever, we weren't, you didn't expect so much extra content when things like um, Smash Brothers Brawl and Mario Kart Wii and all these other Wii games came out. The fact that they had all this much more content crammed in as they did in the GameCube era was like, whoa, holy shit, and Mario Kart Wii was like that. The fact that you had, what was it, like 32 characters to choose from? There were so many unlockables. I'm a sucker for unlockable characters and stuff. Not ones you have to, like, buy in DLC and shit, but ones you actually get to unlock. I'm a sucker for that. I love that. And Mario Kart Wii had so many characters to unlock, and a lot of carts, again actual like carts you could choose from from a set list and not like build your own car there's like 500 combinations and you'll never find one that works for you this one was just like here's a character are they uh, lightweight medium light or heavyweight here are three cars and three bikes for each class and there you go that's your lot and i think that worked a lot better mario kart we had some m amazing music some amazing tracks some of the best in the series i would say and just an atmosphere that I don't think has ever been repeated or replicated. Not much more I can say about Mario Kart other than Mario Kart Wii was one of the more awesome in the series. Number 43 we have the original Legend of Zelda. This is another one that was only on here this year. Uh, I never played the original Legend of Zelda until this year and it's another one of those ones where I didn't think I would like it, but after playing it I was just like wow this is this is so good. I love this. After I finished it, I almost wanted to go and play it again. <laughs> like, I'd, I'd sat there for four hours, and I just finished it. I beat Gandalf. I never thought I'd beat Gandalf um, in the original Legend of Zelda. I, I don't think I'm a good enough gamer to do things like that. But I beat him. I sat there, and I was like, oh, I want to do that again. <laughs> it was just an amazing adventure they had. And, um, again, like... I guess you could call it cheating, whatever. I had a map up of uh, Hyrule on the on my computer while I played the game. So I could be like, hmm, okay, where can I go from here? Ah, that looks like something up there. Let's find that. Oh, it's a dungeon. Okay. So, you know, I did that, and you can call that cheating. For me, I just, I don't like getting lost. I don't find that fun. Um, but I think having that map, and then you get a map with, like, Nintendo Power or, like, the game or something, there had to be maps somewhere in the 80s originally. So, you know, call it cheating if you want, but having a map and playing the original Legend of Zelda was an experience that I can't believe I waited this long. Especially since I played Zelda 2 um, since I was like 3 or 4 years old. But I never played the original. How did that even happen? How did I end up playing Zelda 2 my whole life and not the original? I don't know, but I'm really glad that I fixed that now. 
probably one of my favorite Zelda games of all time. The original, the best. The Legend of Zelda on the NES. I say the best, but I think there's a couple higher up. Number 42, we have Banjo-Tooie on the Nintendo 64. One of the best platformers ever. Nintendo 64 era had just some of the best platformers. Not of the Nintendo 64, not of Generation 5, not of the 90s, ever. You didn't get better than those Nintendo 64 classics, and I will say that to my fucking grave. And Banjo-Tooie was amazing. It was one of those games where it didn't have the overwhelming amount of unlockables that Donkey Kong 64 had. It had a nice balance of uh, collectibles in a world and a lot of places to explore. Something that I think... Ukulele is not on this list. I'm just going to say that now. And I'm saying that because I want to use Ukulele to sort of explain why Banjo-Tooie works. Ukulele has massive but empty worlds. I've only done two because I gave up, but nothing in those worlds was like a marker. I would sit, stand there and go, I don't know where I am, but in Banjo-Tooie, you go to the first world. There's a big statue. There's a big Aztec temple. There's a big, like, battle arena. There's a big mumbo hut. All these, like, all these areas that you can be like, you can stand there, look around, and immediately go, ah, I know where I am. That's Mumbo's hut. Okay, I'll go this way. Like, instantly, you can tell. And I think that is what it is. When you have a smaller level, but just rich with actual buildings and objects and things that are unique. And when you do any sort of platforming, um, sorry, any sort of, like, exploration, platforming, collecting game, the worst thing you can have is a bare level. Because you don't know where you go and you get confused. And that's why I think Banjo Tui works. All the worlds have, like, really um, well defined areas. As if you go later on, like, oh, here's the carnival world. So obviously, here's all the rides. You can be like, okay, well, there's not going to be a big empty, like, carnival ride. They're all going to be their own little things. There's the one where you drop into the, the basket, there's the horror world, there's all this sort of thing. Like, you know where you are. And when you do that, you can be like, okay, I'll get all the collectibles in this little area, and then I'll move on. And that way, you don't miss stuff. I mean, sometimes you'll miss things, but you're not going to be, like, roaming around going, oh my god, where am I, where is this? And I think Banjo Tui got that balance kind of right. Some of the levels are a bit confusing and a bit too big, a little too big, a little too big. And the backtracking can be annoying when there's parts of a world that you have to keep coming back to. That's a couple things they got wrong, but other than that, man, this is really... I haven't even talked about the music. Just... Fuck. Do you need me to tell you about Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie music? Do you really need to tell me to tell you? I don't think you need me to tell you about Banjo music. And the graphics for the time were absolutely ace as well. Like, surprisingly, really solid for Nintendo 64. Like, yeah, it came late in the era. But wow, is it amazing to see. Just a really nice, well-rounded game. I love it. So what's going to wrap it up? What's number 41? Well, this is one that I don't think a lot of people know about. And that is a real damn shame. Number 41 is Juiced. The original Juiced on Xbox. Not Juiced 2. That game fucking sucked. Juiced on Xbox. This was the one of the first games I played on Xbox. Now, I played NES and Nintendo 64 at the time, so when the Xbox came out, um, this was my introduction to proper modern, the first sort of modern graphics. You would argue that um, the Xbox, the PS2, and the GameCube were the birth of sort of modern um, graphics of the time, and this was my first introduction to it, and when I saw how good everything looked induced and how nice the cars looked. I just, I was blown away. I'm still in awe even today. The graphics and just everything in this game looks so beautiful. The cars look so amazing. Juiced is a racing game where you have all these like groups and you 
race, um, you race with each other, you bet, you get prizes for winning, and you use that cash money to get more cars and build them up. I think there's something like 50 cars or something in the game that you can get, and then you can build up that collection, and you can race for pinks, and you can, um, you can modify your car with all these really cool parts, and you can color it with like metallic and pearlescent colors, and because of how good the graphics look, you really do want to get those pearlescent colors, because holy crap, and it was really, really solid, just all sort of little managements you can do with your cars, all the, all the cars you can get, um, all six of the um, main leaders of the other six groups uh, actually had uh, a face, a voice, you could talk to them, it was really, really cool. Juice is one of those games where I think not a lot of racing games at the time, or even nowadays, could match just how sort of perfect and how balanced Juice got it. The only thing that was bad is that when you started getting to the higher horsepower cars, um, the control was just terrible. You would spin out every five seconds. You could not control it to save yourself. Luckily, you can get around that by having um, your computer control crew um, do the higher races, and you can just sort of do the lower races yourself. And you'll still get money and everything that way, so I recommend doing that. It kind of makes it just like a management simulator if you play it like that. But hey, management simulators are really cool, and I think Juiced might actually be the best management simulator that I've ever played, and it's not even a management sim, so there you go. Juiced is just an amazing game all around. I love it. It's just... I I can't say much more. I adore it. So that was 50 to 45, so, you know, next time, 40 to 31. And, yeah, now we're just getting into some... Some games I could ramble about forever, so these I feel like these videos are going to get longer and longer. How long has this one been going on for? Oh my god, 27 minutes. Have I really rambled 27 minutes about 10 games? Oh, wow. Well, thank you guys so much for watching if you made it all the way through this. I love you guys so much. Um, if you did enjoy this, leave a like and follow on with me through as we go on to the next one. So, I will see you guys there. Take care. Goodbye.